Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and uh, just a few things, announcements to begin. Uh, we are posting these videos on other platforms like BitChute and also Parlor. Uh, so um, just to let you know that we are not um, just posting in one place. Good to know, right? Um, second thing, Make Americans Free Again, a couple of updates. Uh, some of the state auditors are interested in looking into some of the testing anomalies, uh, such as people who have um, um, registered to have a test done and uh, didn't actually show up for the test and then they ended up getting results in the mail and that sort of thing. And so if you go to our website, makeamericansfreeagain.com, you'll see a link if you live in Ohio uh, to report such events. Good idea to let uh, the auditor know. That that's going on. Um, I'm doing some conference calls for people who are interested, have questions, etc. Um, and the dates are Wednesday, August 19th at 5 p.m., Tuesday, August 25th at 1 p.m., Wednesday, September 2nd at 9 p.m., and Sunday, September 6th at 7 p.m. Trying to do various times because everybody's got different schedules, but if you want to talk about how to further our efforts or you want to get involved or you have questions about what we're doing, um, this is an opportunity to engage in a group discussion with me and help, hopefully sort some of these things out. So I wish I could talk to each and every one of you individually. I can't. My time is just so crazy right now as you might imagine and then um, yesterday's newsletter article is by one of my great business associates and dear friends dr peter bregan and his wife ginger it deals with treatment i think you know what i mean by that and if you would like to have that article, you can become a subscriber to the newsletter and we'll send you some of the back issues of the COVID collection. Um, so with that, let's go on ahead and get into, I wanna share some data with you from the Centers for Disease Control on how hot spots are determined in the United States. You might want to know that because hot spots, once they're declared, um, are the reasons for masks and lockdowns and all kinds of rules and regulations. So if you're looking at what is the number one or the number two hot spots in the United States, you might think it would be Los Angeles County, which has a couple hundred thousand confirmed cases in August. Um, might be Miami-Dade, Florida, which is um, currently showing 121,000 cases, or uh, Houston has 75,000. Those might be the places that you would think, but the answer, uh, the number one place is Columbia County, Florida, and it's all in how the calculations are done, which I'm gonna share with you. Um, in this case, the CDC defines a hotspot as a county with the most cases per 100,000 population, over the most recent two week period. So this means that counties that have, for example, low population, but perhaps a correctional facility would end up showing as a hotspot, sometimes because of the outbreak in the correctional facility. So, um, and that's often not disclosed. So I'm gonna give you some examples. So let's go to Columbia County, Florida. It's America's leading coronavirus hotspot as of the time that I'm making this video, and that changes. Um, the population of the entire county is less than 72,000, and the city's largest city only has 12,000, so it's a, it's a mostly rural-type area. As of August 11th, it had 2,562 confirmed cases through the whole time span and 10 deaths. A closer look shows that the county reported nearly 500 of those cases in a two-day period on July 20th and 21st because there was an outbreak at Columbia Correctional Institution, a facility that can hold up to over 1,400 inmates. That outbreak, which involved hundreds of prisoners, is 54% of the county's total. And that is how, because it happened in a two-day period, it became the leading hotspot according to the Centers for Disease Control criteria. There are 3,141 counties in the country, and this one was the leader. Um, two of the other four hotspots in Florida basically were calculated in the same way. Jackson County, which was number seven, had reported 1,600 total cases as of August 1st. But their, list, their listing of the top hotspots is because 500 cases were reported in just two days, similar to Columbiana County. 56% of the cases occurred in its correctional facility and nursing homes. So, um, and if you have a couple of days where there are a lot of cases, instead of spreading it out over time or looking at cumulative data, 
that gets you um, registered as a hotspot. Glades County is number eight, and it's west of um, Lake Okeechobee, has three deaths and 391 cases. So you might wonder, how is it number eight on the hotspot list? Well, it reported five or fewer cases on 13 of the 14 days in the reporting period, including five days on which it reported zero cases in two days in which it reported just one. But on July 24th, there were 84 cases propelling it past 3,133 other United States counties to make its way to the number eight slot. Glades County is home to a detention center operated by Immigration and Customs Enforcement and two thirds of the cases came out of that facility and happened in a concentrated period of time. So you're talking about sparsely populated areas that have a two day spike and suddenly go to the hot spot um, designation. Now Texas is also supposed to be the site of hot spots, and of course we know that the governor there has taken a lot of actions in response. Now New York has 167 deaths per 100,000 population and Texas has 24. So how the heck did Texas end up on the list? Well, Real County, Texas is number three, has a population of 3,400 plus or minus people. The first case was reported on June 4th and um, there were uh, no mandates at that point in time because the caseload was less than 20. So I wanna point out that if your county has 20 or more cases, then mandates uh, start to uh, come into play. July 23rd, significant increase in cases due to an outbreak at a local nursing home. 50 positive cases were reported in a single day, but positive cases have returned to one to three per day since the one day spike and there are no deaths up to, up to this date in the county, yet it hits the hot spot designation because of that one day spike. And of course, the governor of Texas then says the whole state is in a state of emergency. DeWitt County, Texas is number four on the hotspot list with 20,000 plus or minus residents, 604 cases. Cuero is the county seat, home to the state prison, a state prison with 28 cases. Um, a nursing home outbreak again suddenly increased the case count. Um, of all cases, um, only 13 people were hospitalized and 410 out of the 604 have recovered. You don't hear so much about that. You just hear a lot about, oh my, how many cases, and it's a hot spot. We have to take action. Uh, Refugio County, um, also in Texas, is number six with has about 7,000 residents. Again, small population. 209 people since May have tested positive, 92 recovered, no deaths, and the average daily cases are eight per day. So you wonder, how can eight day people testing positive a case turn this into a hotspot. Well, in mid-July, DeWitt and Refugio counties both were host to four Texas military department COVID-19 testing sites offering approximately 500 free COVID-19 tests in each county to improve access to testing for rural residents. Case counts in both counties saw a spike in late July after those events. So what happened is sending the National Guard out to test a bunch of people who weren't sick um, asymptomatic, gend up these cases, and then you end up with these counties being hotspots. Now, many governors have been criticized because they have loosened restrictions and they're trying to return their states back to normal. But, um, and, and one of the reasons is, oh my gosh, look at these hotspots and look at what's going on. But when these numbers are taken out of context, and I have uh, talked about this on this channel quite a bit, that part of the problem and what gets everybody all excited and nervous about all of this is that um, is that the numbers are out of context or simply just misreported. And I've told many, many people, um, uh, that, well, a couple things I'll say about this. Number one is I don't post transient data like this on, on our website or anyplace else because the number of cases will have changed by the time you see this video. Now, is it going to have changed significantly? No, but if there were 604 cases, it's not going to show 604 four cases by the time you check this when you see this video. So, so I don't post the transient data, but I always tell people pick a data point to follow and just start looking into this. And I have not had yet a person who actually uh, looked into it with the idea of discovering what's going on who has an email back and said, I see exactly what you're talking about. And there's so many different ways that, that you can verify. Now, some people look into this stuff and, and they're doing it, I call it, con well, it's called confirmation bias. In other words, my mind is made up, so I'm gonna just go find a data point that confirms what I wanna think about something 
and then that's what I'm going to hang on to. Um, if you're going to do a good investigation, and I encourage everybody to do this, um, pick some data points and actually go about it with curiosity to see what you find out, and you're gonna to start to see the kinds of things that I'm reporting here and understand my perspective on this. Um, so I think that's enough for now. I know this is a lot of data, and, I, and just follow the train of thought here, and, and basically what the concluding comments would be about this is that a hotspot is determined based on cases per 100,000 people. The smaller the area, the easier it is to turn it into a hotspot, particularly when you're testing asymptomatic people in parking lots and, and calling them cases when they test positive, and we know there are some issues associated with that. All you need is an outbreak in a confinement facility, whether it's prison or nursing home for a day, and all of a sudden that county or that area becomes a hotspot. And then if you end up with two or three of them in a state, it's easy for a governor to say, oh my gosh, we're in a state of emergency, mask wearing, shut things down, no concerts, no football, kids can't go to school. And you can see how wildly out of proportion those kinds of responses are in terms of the data that I've just provided to you. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Pass this on to others who you think would enjoy learning the truth about all of this that we're going through right now. Um, and I will be back to you tomorrow with more news.